So I want to talk about the stunning promise and the stunning surprise and the struggle I had with being stunned during Advent. So it's kind of a theme already. I mean, the scriptures in the lectionary, I, I almost always preach those. But I try to keep the historic meaning of the, of the theme, which is anticipating Christ, anticipating welcome to Christ, is not an easy process. It requires tons of grace, and even still, we are surprised, we are stunned, we are unready. Resistant. Because because of the, the whole cycle, the whole uh, the whole discussion about struggling to be ready. Yeah. You know, Christians love to say, "Well, you know, Jews." You know. Yeah, okay. Like we're more ready. Yeah. You know, uh, like if Jesus showed up, I mean, that's the old uh, 1960s and 30s and 1910s. You know, if Jesus showed up in your church, would you recognize him? Well, probably, and by the way, that's a dumb rhetorical question. I don't preach ever rhetorical questions, so let me make it just a side note. I never preach. Shouldn't we want to be better? Dumb question. Okay, but yes. <laughs> but, but the question is, would we be ready for Christ to come? Well, that's a dumb rhetorical question, but the answer is always no, we wouldn't. We never are. Yeah, yeah right. So that's, that's the element. That's why it's in there. Yeah, that's, and the history of Advent is about anticipating, being anticipating, so you're not as surprised. Great idea. Uh, but some of you watch horror movies. I don't have to like horror movies, but I know the drill, right? You know that a horror movie is going to surprise you. And even though you know, you don't know exactly the second. So you know, right? So even though you're ready, you're not ready. That's the way it works. And that's Advent. You're always surprised. Lost our surprise, and 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 it's so it it moves so seamlessly in Christmas conversations. You remember being surprised at a birthday present or a Christmas present? All of us have been. You ever be really surprised? So now here's my first commercial. Then I'll take you to my uh, My wife ran out of pacifist. Okay? Even though I've done martial arts most of my life, she ran out of pacifist. She doesn't believe in guns. And one year I was. Really, artistic. one year I went to look for the easel. I went to the painting. And I found this easel. I bought the easel and they, they, they folded it up into this long, they put it in this little box. <laughs> and I bring this box home. I play it down. I said, hey, James. Wow. You're early this year. Yeah. You can even give me any hints. Well, I'm like, uh, I'll just. Sometimes I worry about you being home alone. <laughs> By the third conversation, she's like, you know my values, don't you? I mean, you know my values. You wouldn't want me to get them. I played that one. Mm. It was a great Christmas. <laughs> but you remember being surprised at gifts. You always offer. That's what you hope he gives you. Like, oh, and you're delighted at this. That's what we're going to say. Yeah. Or as a horror movie, you know something about it. It's a sense of anticipation because you're already on the edge of your season. Yeah, and that is a season of anticipation. You're not. But, and, and I, I promise everybody every year, you know, Christ will come to you different this year than ever before. Yeah, and, but an anticipated surprise is still a surprise. And the message of Advent is consistent with that. No, they're not. But it does remind us that as much as Advent, much as we can anticipate, so now we're not raw to the surprise. There still is a surprise. And Advent is meant to talk about. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Keep your eyes out for the surprise, but it will surprise you still. It always will. All right, so in thinking confidence, here's the deal. Um, 
I want to I want to be both a textual and a topical preacher. Textual preacher often says, but I want to really have the Bible lead my conversation. Great. But the topical preacher says, I want people to find something relevant and meaningful in their journey. Great. Why would we make those oppositions? So I know you've got friends who will only preach the life story, even if they can't find a living meaning in the passages that are there for that Sunday. Uh, okay, so I'm just... And I know you've got friends who preach passages that are, that, sorry, messages that are trying to be relevant, but really are not rooted in Scripture. Okay? I think both of them lose. So I have these topics in front of me. There are some seasons, though, that I don't have down here, some months I don't have because they change, depending on what the lectionary guides me to. And if during a season of prayer, because I'm doing two months usually out doing this, but if during a season of prayer I feel like the lectionary is not guiding me to something I need to preach on, and I can feel the belongings of the church family and they're aching for a certain topic or challenge, then I'm going to start looking, God, uh, take me through your Bible. I'm looking for some scriptures on this topic that I can Engage, right? So, yes. Do you ever return to the topics that you... Most years I go back to these. Sorry. Later in the year. I'm sure I talk about fearfulness at some points in the year and gratitude at some points in the year and being, being light and, and living life. I'm sure I do. Resurrections. But I think I hit them in a really hard way. Uh, an example. Um, during the month of September, and this was off lecture. And this, this is a big deal. This has actually been the result of about four months' worth of prayer, huge, heavy anticipation, major, major, major. Okay? I mean, really major. So, during that time, I developed a scheme I wanted the church family to see, memorize, brew on, and really focus a lot of our ministry around. Okay? And this is what I call the four directions. Okay? And they come from Jesus' words, because a lot of times his words are pretty good. Right? Jesus says, love the Lord your God. North Star, right? Our conversation is love the Lord your God. Love your neighbor. As you love yourself. A new commandment I give to you, that is you love one another, which is a church family. You literally commit yourself to a church. I presented this in four different messages as what Jesus said at the center of our faith. He says, on, on, on the, when you're having this discussion, uh, love your love Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength, and your neighbors yourself, he says, well, on that hang the whole, everything, the law and the prophets. Okay? And then we hear him say, Love one another as I've loved you. It's a new commandment. Okay, so this is he. This he said is how you do your call. So that was my September sermon. So I'm saying this to explain what church is like. Not in September. I was done with it. Okay, it was the second week in October. I was talking about the, the Moses passage from this last Sunday, and in it, the people. Recall, I mean, we, our Bible is full of the Jewish people recalling them being stupid. The Jewish family felt it essential to keep their stories of being stupid in front of themselves. The Christian family did the same. You see the disciples all in the Gospels just being complete dirt. What's the do with that? I don't know if we get to take over. And they're just all out of okay? And they keep those stories. Why do they keep those stories? Because it's actually important for them to remember we're wounded. And that we can all foul up in this love for God. And we must face our failures and our tendencies that can make us go south. So now, did you hear that theme? We must face our failures and our tendencies that make us go south. So, two-thirds of the way through the sermon, I had the PowerPoint screen, which is a luxury I have. Most of you don't. Click this back on. And I gave people a heads up. I'm going to pray a prayer in a few minutes, and I'm going to ask you to face failures. Maybe God has failed you, at least in the way you see it. Would you?
you have failed God. Maybe a neighbor has failed somebody around you. You have failed them. Maybe you have failed yourself. Maybe somebody here in church, or maybe the institution of the church, has failed you profoundly. So when we're done, because we've done like the Jewish people, telling their ugly stories as well as their good ones, I'm going to ask you to pray through the four directions. And ask if there's healing that needs to happen between you and God. Or healing that needs to happen between you and a neighbor. If there's a failure with yourself that you need to fix, or a failure with someone in church or the church as an institution, let's pray through them. So, what I was able to do then was to reanimate this four part theme two weeks later. Or actually, I preached it the first time four weeks ago. So it didn't. But yeah, and, and this is the kind of thing I will keep in mind. I mean, so, yes, often these themes come back. I will say a lot of pastors who are claimed pastors, what I hear from them is so hard to pick a topic. And so, that's great. Then follow the lectionary. Usually the gospel, but but don't stay only there. You're bigger than that. You know, preach the gospel for half the year. Preach the other passages for the other part of the year. And please, because we are rooted in the Jewish family, make sure a lot of that's from the local.